I have another screen. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're so glad you're here with us today. Please put your comments on the chat and let us know where you are and where you're coming from. We have a lot of societies joining us today, and it would be really nice to see all your names in there. Hello, ooh, we have some friends coming from St. Louis. That's really nice in Long Island. Welcome, welcome. It's very nice to see you all. We have Virginia and Bergen joining us today as well. Well, societies gathering. And it's so How can free thinkers help restore democracy? And we're glad you're all joining us. Oh, we have Illinois and Minneapolis and St. Louis. Welcome, welcome. Please put your comments on the chat bar so we know where you're from and where you're joining us. I'd also um, like to share that today we're going to have a little bit of a different format for those of you who are used to the regular meetings. We're in a webinar format, as you can tell. So you can't see each other, but we're all here together. So please share your comments on the chat bar so that on the chat so that we can see where you're from. Um, use the chat for comments. And if you want to share anything with each other, know that when you're asking questions of the panelists, there will be a Q&A prompt. And please put your questions on the Q&A so that we can see them more easily since there's so many of you joining us today. We have more St. Louis, we have Maywood, Iowa. There's New York Society is here as well. Welcome everyone. It's very, very nice to have you all. Thank you for joining us today. White Plains, Austin. Oh, we have Maryland. Hello, Andrew from RISEC. <laughs> I can't call everybody by names. I'm sorry, there's so many of you coming in at once, but please feel our welcome. And I know we're very happy you're here with us today. North Carolina, how exciting to have the whole country joining today. Please put your comments on the chat so that we know where you're coming from. We would love to welcome you and your society. <clears throat> we have panelists and we have speakers from all over the country today. So it's very exciting to have to have the ethical societies and the humanist societies joining and any other guests who are joining us today, please be welcome. Feel free to introduce yourselves and where you're from. Even if you're not part of any societies, we're very happy you're here with us. <laughs> we see there are people from the office coming in in Atlanta, Silver Spring, Bergen, Pennsylvania, Baltimore, that's so exciting. So many different places. Welcome, welcome. For those of you who are joining us right at this minute, please put your comments on the chat so that we know where you're from. Chicago, New York, New Jersey, Asheville. Welcome, welcome, Saic, St. Louis. Lots of people from St. Louis today, welcome. New Jersey. Today, we're joining the All Society platform of replacing magical thinking with rational discourse. How can free thinkers help restore democracy? 
in this all societies platform. Ooh, apparently it's snowing in Virginia. New Jersey's here in the house. We're in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is not snowing, but it's very cold. Hello, Baltimore and Philly. If you're joining us today, please put your comments on the chat. You're gonna notice we're using a little bit of a different format today. We're having a webinar format because of the number of people that are joining us. Hello, New York. Um, please put your comments on the chat. There will be a prompt for questions and answers after the speakers. Um, you're gonna put your questions specifically on the questions and answer on the Q&A so that it's easier for us to sort through the questions so we can address as many of them as we can. And feel free to use the chat for your comments and to let us know where you're from. Hello? Yes. Please let us know where you're coming from and what society, and if you're not from a society, just what city you're joining us from. We'd love to welcome you to this All Societies platform. Atlanta, Georgia, Columbia. It's lovely. We have Bergen, we have Long Island, we have Mississippi. Washington, Hendersonville. New Jersey. Rockland County, Pickskill, Bronx, some RISAC people are here as well, North Carolina, Winston, St. Louis, New York. Welcome, welcome everyone. Washington is here as well. So many different societies are joining us right now. Please introduce yourselves. It's really lovely to see the whole country coming together like this. And if you're not from the country, also let us know. That would be very exciting. Baltimore here, Colorado, and Maryland. It's all good. It doesn't matter where you found us. We're just glad you made it here and that you're joining us today for this platform. Philadelphia, so many different countries. For those of you who are just joining us right now, please add your names and where you're from on the chat, Womptons, um, so that we can say hello. I'm listening, I am listening.
the voices of all my kids singing, howling, hooting. We're all calling into the wind. My heart is And all the joys of Atlantic and Pacific flow The Great Lakes and the Gulf of Mexico The land between sustains us all To cherish it thou tireless call Arise, arise I see the future in your eyes. To a more perfect union we aspire and lift our voices from the fire. We've reached these shores from many lands. We came with hungry hearts and hands. Some came by force and some by will. At auction block and dock and mills. Arise, arise. I see the future in your eyes. To a more perfect union, we aspire and lift our voices from the fire. We died in your fields and your factories. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. With an old coat hanger in a room somewhere, a trail of tears and electric chair. Arise, arise. I see the future in your eyes. To a more perfect union, we aspire and lift. Our voices from the fire. Our great responsibility to be guardians of our liberty. Till tyrants bow to the people's dream and just this flow like a mighty stream. Arise, arise, I see the future in your eyes. To a more perfect union we aspire and lift our voices from the fire. Arise, I see the future in your eyes. To a more perfect union, we aspire and lift our voices from the 
Welcome to all the society's platform. Thank you to the Washington Ethical Society's chorus for the opening song and Dupre and Barry Kornhauser from Ethical, Brooklyn Ethical that is, singing the anthem written by Jean Rowe when she was president of Brooklyn Society for Ethical Culture. This morning's platform is the second in a new series from the American Ethical Union designed to bring us together, members and friends from all the ethical societies, as well as others from the broader humanist community who share our aims for building a more equitable, just and ethical society. We join with millions of people in this country and beyond who envisage a more just and compassionate world, a more ethical world realized through our dedication to action and our endeavors together to honor the worth and dignity of all people. So whether you are a longtime member or a brand new member of any of the 24 ethical societies across America or a friend, relative, neighbor, individually, or from other groups or organizations, we're glad that you've joined us this morning. This All Societies platform is hosted by members from the Brooklyn Society for Ethical Culture, the Ethical Culture Society of Essex County, New Jersey, the Ethical Humanist Society of the Triangle of North, in North Carolina, and the Washington uh, Society. My name is Vandra Thorburn, and I'm a regular member of the Brooklyn Society for Ethical Culture. So today's platform is going to reflect different elements from our societies. For example, at Brooklyn, we open our platform with the lighting of candles and reading together the following. Each week, we light candles of understanding against the shadows of our times. This for us is a sign of our standing together with people who have sought goodness, sometimes at great risk. And we also make a land acknowledgement. All of our societies are on land that was originally belonged to indigenous peoples. If you want to re recognize the indigenous peoples of your own society or area, please feel to, free to post it in the chat. At, at Brooklyn Ethical, we say, we acknowledge that we gather on the unceded territory of the Kanasi and Nanape peoples and honor with gratitude the people who have stewarded the land throughout the generations. We remember that the Kanasi and Anape are among the many indigenous communities in the United States. Let us in our quest for justice commit to continuing to learn how to better be stewards of the land and be better allies to the indigenous communities. Greetings, everyone. It's wonderful to be with this gathering from across the country. As we honor those who occupied this land before us, we too want to honor those in our families and those 
that we are aware of through their writings, their great contribution to the society. But today, I would like to suggest that we expand our usual practice. At the Essex uh, Society in Maplewood, New Jersey, we generally invite participants to remember people who inspired them, people who opened their hearts, people who uh, challenged them to be better than they are. On this day, given our topic, given what we're trying to attempt to build bridges at a time of great divide, may I suggest that we expand the challenge we're putting to ourselves to remember also those who sometimes hardened our hearts, those for whom it was difficult to, uh, to learn, those, for, those who challenged us in ways that we didn't welcome. They too were on a path, they too were struggling with the, the, the elements that their lives presented to them. And sometimes they taught us more than we realized. I would like to suggest that in remembering those who passed, that we also remember those that we struggled with. Let us arise and continue with the work that they left unfinished. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. At the Washington Ethical Society, we include in our platforms a time for meditation so that we can be fully present with each other in our learning and discovery. If it helps you to focus on the meditation, you may wish to close your eyes or soften your gaze and pay attention to the stability of your body. If you're standing, is your weight evenly distributed? Are your knees locked? And if you're sitting, how are you connected? with your seat to the floor? How does your posture feel? Are you carrying tension anywhere in your body? Simply notice how you feel in this moment. Pausing helps us to respond to the moment with wisdom rather than reacting out of instinct. Self-awareness is part of being in community. So next, bring your awareness to your breath. Attend to the feeling in your nose and mouth as you breathe in and as you breathe out. Take another nourishing breath in and out. And notice the feeling of air coming into your lungs and back out again. Perhaps you feel your diaphragm expanding or your chest rise and fall. If it is consistent with your well being, hold a hand to your heart as you're taking another nourishing breath. Can you feel your heart beating? We know that our hearts need each breath, not just our metaphorical hearts that love, but our physical beating hearts need the oxygen we breathe in and need the release of carbon dioxide going out. Separate tissues and organs work together to draw in what we need and to let go of what is complete. You can relax your hand and continue to breathe in a way that's good for you. Notice the sensations in your body. Where are you relaxed? Where do you ache? Where is your body healing even in this moment? Whether we pay attention or not, our tissues and organs are working together all the time. Our digestive system, our circulatory system, our nervous system are all operating with or without our conscious involvement. Different ways of being weave together to sustain the wonder of life. Take one more nourishing breath as we bring our attention back to the present moment. Let us reflect on the ways life and health depend on the cooperation of many cells, many different specializations and relationships. In the body of democracy, our people and our communities also depend on each other, on the free flow of that which nourishes us, 
on the ability to release what no longer serves us on cooperation. Just as our heart and lungs need one another, let us remember that we need one another. Let us carry this awareness with us during today's platform. We continue our centering time with music for reflection and we welcome back Dupre and Barry Kornhauser. Die Gedanken sind frei, my thought freely flow. Die Gedanken sind frei, my thoughts give me power. No scholar can map them, no hunter can trap them, no man can deny. Die Gedanken sind frei, no man can deny. Die Gedanken sind frei. I think as I please, and that gives me pleasure. My conscience decrees, this right I must treasure. My thoughts will not cater to do or dictator, no man can deny a dika dunkins and cry. No man can deny a dika dunkins and cry. And should tyrants take me, throw me in prison, my thoughts will burst forth. Like blossoms in seasons, foundations may crumble and structures will tumble, but free men shall cry, a dika donkeys and fry. But free men shall cry, a dika donkeys and fry. Thank you, Barry and Dupre, a lovely song recognized by some of the ethical culturists among us as a, as a grand old hymn of ethical culture. So today's platform is a special event for us. And by a stroke of fortune, we have just passed Free Thinkers Day, honoring the birthday of Thomas Paine. Those who expect to reap the blessings of freedom must undergo the fatigue of supporting it. And these are the times that try men's souls. So originally the host member organizer, organizers among me and Lynn and Elaine and Chris invited Congressman Jamie Raskin who's co-chair of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus to speak. That was some months ago uh, when he agreed and he proposed the platform title. Tragically, at the end of December, the congressman and his family lost their son, Tommy Raskin, to depression. And just days later, the Capitol was besieged and Congressman Raskin was then asked to be the lead impeachment manager. That's when we heard that he needed to reschedule his visit to the end of March. So it is with the Congressman in mind that we held his title, replacing magical thinking with rational discourse. How can free thinkers help restore democracy? 
and invited three ethical leaders to share their reflections. So it is my great pleasure to ask Bart Warden, Executive Director of the American Ethical Union, to introduce our panelists and to moderate the questions and answers afterwards. Over to you, Bart. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, let me just... So uh, today we had three scholar activists from our ethical humanist community speaking uh, on the topic, replacing magical thinking with rational discourse and how can our free thinkers help restore democracy? Our first speaker is Joan Johnson Lewis. Uh, Joan is a clergy person, coach, writer, and teacher, and has been an ethical culture leader since 1991. She currently serves the Riverdale Yonkers Society for Ethical Culture, and she's served ethical societies in Chicago, Northern Virginia, and Brooklyn. As a scholar, Joan has had a special interest in studying humanism, social reform, the transcendentalists, and the history of women in world religions, her other areas of study include human relationships, history, science, progressive politics, leadership, nonviolent communication, philosophy, website design, and content and music. A bit far ranging for sure. She has also served the American Ethical Union in multiple ways for many years. Joan was the uh, leading force in the development and operation of the American Ethical Union's Lay Leadership Summer School. And that has been an essential catalyst for lay and professional leadership for many years. She served as interim executive director, was president of the National Leaders Council, and has been a key member of numerous committees and initiatives, including her current work in racial justice and lay leader training. Next will be Dr. David Sprinson, who was a longtime professor of philosophy at the CW Post campus of Long Island University. He co-founded the Institute for Sustainable Development at Long Island University and was a founder also of the Long Island Progressive Coalition, the Research and Education Project of Long Island, and the Research and Education Project. Oh, said that again, Education Project of Long Island. Sorry, Dr. Sprinson. Dr. Sprinson is the author of four books on philosophy and social theory and has been a long time and very active member of the Ethical Humanist Society of Long Island. And following Dr. Sprinson, will be Christian Hayden. Christian has worked for years as a community educator in Philadelphia. A natural bridge builder, Christian has been effective at creating and maintaining connections and communicating with families, schools, and organizations. He spent a year in Ghana with the Humanist Service Corps and was awarded the Mazur Fellowship in 2016 for his proposal to develop a youth-friendly, educational, and trauma-informed multi-pronged colloquy-like experience with different partners in Philadelphia uh, schools, with community centers, and finally to spread the model to other cities and to other ethical societies. Christian is a member of the Philadelphia Ethical Society and also is an ethical culture leader in training, currently interning with the Ethical Society of St. Louis. He's described himself as a full-time facilitator, very part-time poet, and is striving to be a 24 seven humanist. So welcome to our three speakers. Uh, and Joan Johnson Lewis will be starting us off. Joan. Thank you, Bart. Today in the United States, a significant number of people truly believe that the president in the White House is actually the previous president wearing a skin mask. Well, it is actually no surprise that we got to where we are today. Chris Hedges wrote this in 2007. The split in America, rather than simply economic, is between those who embrace reason, who function in the real world of cause and effect, and those who, numbed by isolation and despair, now seek meaning in a mythical world of intuition, a world that is no longer reality-based, a world of magic. That quote is from his book, American Fascists. He concluded that unlike fascism in the 1920s through 1940s, in the US, no one had yet called for dictatorship or used physical violence to suppress opposition. In 1944, Henry Wallace was the sitting vice president when he wrote about fascism for the Sunday New York Times Magazine. He wrote, American fascism will not be really dangerous until there is a purposeful coalition among the cartelists, the deliberate poisoners of public information, and those who stand for the KKK type of demagoguery. Sound familiar? Maybe calling the press enemies of the public? 
increasingly active white nationalism, anti-Black violence and anti-Semitism, and cartelists. Henry Wallace, again, monopolists who fear competition and who distrust democracy because it stands for equal opportunity. Does that sound familiar? Add in the right-wing theocrats Hedges was writing about. Wallace also wrote in that 1944 essay, the supreme god of a fascist to which his ends are directed may be money or power, may be a race or a class, may be a military clique or an economic group, or may be a culture, religion, or a political party. Well, now they have moved to violence harassing a congressional candidate so he drops out of the race, leaving unopposed someone who has called for putting bullets in the heads of those she opposes, allowing a pandemic to kill what will end up more than half a million, many of those deaths preventable by action based on reason, evidence, and compassion. It's true, we've never had a full democracy or reason-based culture in the US. Genocide, enslavement, denying many the right to vote. These practices were defended with lies, the happy slave, the savage Indian, the superiority of white men. And it's also true that throughout our history, many have worked to deconstruct those lies, work to expand who is represented and who represents. Moving towards more democracy depends on reason and fact. And what is the opposite of democracy? Well, one opposite is fascism. And by fascism, I don't just mean political bullying. Fascism has many different forms with some common factors. Among them, racial hierarchy backed by authoritarian rule, nationalism, violence. George Orwell wrote of earlier American fascists, one stands amazed at their diversity. What a crew. They are all people with something to lose or people who long for a hierarchical society and dread the prospect of a world of free and equal human beings. He goes on, beyond all the ballyhoo and lies are the simple intention of those with money or privileges to cling to them. Again, does this sound familiar? As Hannah Arendt documented, fascism, fascism depends on people believing lies that their leaders tell lies invented to manipulate those of afraid, who are afraid of losing their money or privileges. Today's magical thinkers believe that they are the ones who are using evidence and reason. It is practically their sacred mantra, do the research. JFK Jr.'s assassination failed and he'll reappear. A pizza parlor without a basement is hiding children in the basement. Those conclusions are for the believer, proudly based on research. They found YouTube videos, listened to podcasts, engaged with a community of self-identified skeptics, extracted meaning from cryptic revelations. It is as if instead of feeling ears and tails of an elephant and thinking they found leaves and vines, they find leaves and vines and think that they found elephants. A task in the last few years was to simply outvote these folks, enable more eligible voters to cast ballots, put government power into the hands of people who are more egalitarian, more evidence-based in their reasoning, even if not perfect people. Narrow success by voting was met with violent attacks to prevent votes being counted. It is magical thinking to believe that the work is done with just one election. We heard from Chris Hedges about those numbed by isolation and despair. Decades earlier, Eric Fromm warned that fascism is an economic and political problem, but the hold it has over the whole people has to be understood on psychological grounds. Those who get caught up in what may be today's fascism are motivated by human needs to belong, to find meaning, to matter, to identify with something larger than oneself even when it turns out that's destructive of self, hurts others and requires suspension of disbelief and a narrow circle of concern. While we're limited human minds leave us all open to confirmation bias, to seeing ourselves in the best light and others in the worst, to deceiving ourselves that we're using reason and not emotion, 
to rigidify our beliefs when we're confronted with evidence that contradicts them, to narrowly define our circle of compassion. We've learned a lot about the psychology of cults and of those who believe the world is about to end. When people lose faith or predictions fail, some leave, but a core remains and their beliefs grow more rigid. Changing minds is not easy. But changing minds by reasoning isn't the only approach. Fascism thrives where there is social and economic inequality. Democracy and a more just society co-create and reinforce each other. Moving away from lies and a social economic hierarchy to democracy, equity, and inclusion isn't easy or quick, but it is where everyone wins. And next we're gonna hear from David. Thank you, Joan. I see, I see I was unmuted, unmuted. Uh, thanks again, Joan. What is magical thinking? It is fanciful, associative and emotional thought. It is making mental connections by associations of images, elaborating, dramatically engaging or emotionally satisfying stories. Its stories are often soothing, personally sustaining, even dramatically engaging. It is often psychologically encouraging, providing us with quite satisfying experiences. But it is thinking that is neither empirically tested nor critically, critically reevaluated in the light of experienced consequences. We are all tempted by such ways of thinking and probably indulge in them quite often. We fantasize, we daydream, sometimes we even pray. And we certainly love dramatic stories, many of which are really quite imaginatively fantastic. We probably all want the world to be one that embodies our hopes, desires, and needs. To be a world in which we feel we belong, where we feel at home and safe. In short, to feel that we are in a world that assuages our fears and anxieties, uncertainties, and powerlessness. How else are we to understand the pervasiveness of human beliefs in eternal beings or in heavenly fathers who look out for our well being? Of course, imaginative thinking can often take us out of our ordinary humdrum reality and our daily routines. It can not only contribute to flights of fancy, but even sometimes nourish our creativity, originality, and artistic innovation. But unless it is intelligently reconnected to the objectively existing social and natural world, it remains nothing but a personal flight of fancy, magical thinking, without constructive, practical, or social relevance. Even worse, however, it often invites identification and even possibly infatuation with its emotionally satisfying scenarios, thus presaging disaster when taken as interpretation of reality and as the guide to action. For magical thinking is not empirically accountable nor rationally coherent. Rather, its associative imagery is fanciful sometimes delusional, and thus not constrained by the need to take into account the real patterns of society and nature. As a guide to action, therefore, it almost invariably leads us in an inappropriate, self-defeating, and likely destructive directions. That is why we need rational thought and critical thinking. So what then is rational thought and critical thinking? It is thought that is internally coherent and objectively attentive and responsive to the experienced consequences of events. The best way to understand the function of rational thought is to compare it to the using of tools and thus to think of ideas as mental tools. Of course, we all know what a tool is, a material object made by someone for a purpose with reference to a job to be done. If the tool is the right one for the job, it will facilitate our task. But if the tool is not well made or is not appropriate or well designed for the job to be done, it will certainly make a mess of the work. Now consider a map, which is a kind of tool to guide us around a terrain. To be useful, the map must be appropriate to the task for, for example, a geological survey map 
would not be very helpful if we were trying to find what roads to take to get us to our destination. But the roadmap, or today the GPS, will only be helpful if it correctly maps the actual existing road patterns. Otherwise, it'll be worse than useless. Similarly with thinking. All thinking involves some mapping of our world. And that means some interpretation of how things fit together. We have to decide what part of the world we are concerned with and what we want to do with it. To this end, we need our ideas that accurately map that world. That is, that make sense of its structure, selecting the relevant causal interactions and the likely practical consequences of different possible actions. That's the very meaning of science. Empirical, experimental, self-correcting science is clearly the most reliable way to map our world. And that's, of course, our best guide to successfully navigating our interaction with that world. If, on the other hand, in place of scientifically based rational thinking, we were to rely on magical thought and the associative emotional patterns that make us feel good, it would be just like using the wrong or poorly designed tools. We're almost certainly going to make a mess of whatever we undertake. Just briefly consider a couple of examples. If you think it is obvious that crime is simply caused by criminals, you will probably conclude that the best way to reduce crime is to focus your research on the criminals that create it. For example, what is it about these criminals that causes them to engage in crime? Have you ever noticed that every time there is a mass murder, we become so focused on understanding the nature and motives of the killer? Focusing on the criminal, we will look into their background, perhaps their genetic endowment, and we'll probably increase law enforcement and even enhance legal penalties in order to repress crime and remove these criminals from society. But of course, with such a criminal character-based focus as your critical conceptual mapping, you are quite unlikely to even consider such possible social determinants of crime as poverty, joblessness, community de deterioration, inadequate education, lack of social supports, family disintegration, even economic exploitation, political oppression, or cultural dehumanization. Wrongly mapping the conceptual and causal terrain is like using the wrong tool to do a job and with similar results. Well, consider the Trump phenomena. If you neglect the significant role that race plays, you will certainly miss an important element. But if you also think that race is the sole or central motive for most Trump supporters, you will completely fail to appreciate those deaths of despair that have devastated so much of white middle America, so brilliantly diagnosed recently by Ann Case and Angus Deaton. Did you know, for example, but for the period since the year 2000, the average life expectancy for the cohort of white Americans between 45 and 54 years of age has actually been declining. And that this is a pattern that is seen almost nowhere else on earth and that includes among people of all races and ethnicities. It would thus be neither sensitive nor respectful to respond to the desperation of such people, as often too many well-meaning people have done, to claim that they benefit from white privilege. Not only would that be personally insensitive, but it's almost certainly counterproductive. Commuting one's dis com communicating one's disdain for their suffering and driving them more firmly into the arms of those who do not insult them. So let us take our humanistic values and our rational and scientific analyses seriously, but also self-critically and with sufficient humility, always remaining on guard against the natural tendencies for self-reinforcing groupthink. We should recognize that our values and goals are never realities to be imposed upon the world as if they embody a perfected of ideal. But rather we should treat them as continually revisible moral and theoretical guides in furthering our present undertakings. That is the path forward for a rationally responsible humanism. Christian, it's all yours. Good morning. 
in 2021, it will be an important activity to intentionally remember. The last few years were an intense, anxiety-ridden news cycle. It had the obvious, and one might add purposeful effect of diminishing public memory. memory. Granted, our ability as a nation to remember has always been in question, but the immediacy of news and the frantic pace of social media have made it important that we intentionally do so to try to remember. So I will remember, and not long ago, though it feels like, I don't know, two years ago, on the 1st of November in 2020, 2020, James Croft laid bare that our democracy was in fact under attack, that we had to prepare for a moment with a process, the results of the election would be challenged. And we had to prepare to fight to protect our democracy. In hindsight, it contained great prescience. But at the time, I personally thought it might be too much. It was too much that there was a danger and possibly a possibly panic inducing disposition. I thought as a nation, we had safeguards, we had checks that would be fine. Here I will say, and I think this is the important point, there is a difference between passive and calm. I was passive ready to watch and let it play out. James was calm in presenting that there was a problem coming and we needed to be prepared. I was wrong and James was right. We are in a cascading, we are in cascading moments of collective regression. If we do not do anything about it, this country may not fall, but families, communities, and many, many dreams of living a dignified life will. We need to remember that night. And whether or not you went, we need to think about the call for a commitment. What are we going to do to not just protect, but expand this democracy? For the free thinker, the humanist, the ethical culturist, the idea of democracy is a spiritual undertaking. The search for it is a common and binding aspiration. The process of realizing struggling towards it is one of our most important spiritual practices, or as Octavia Butler put it, a positive obsession. Democracy as an idea, a process, is not a just about voting. It is the embodiment of a thinking system. It is the measure of one's agency to feel and be connected to the workings and direction of one's society, one's community. This is beyond voting. Democracy is children feeling heard, teachers being supported, leaders responsive and beholden to the voices of the people they serve. Democracy is the constant realization of freedom that echoes from one's body and mind to their community. It is all being seen, the collective honoring of each individual through and through. And the last year we had some important and notable things happen. The ease of voting amid a pandemic, the expanded electorate that expanded the electorate as well as grassroots organizing that wanted us to remember and imagine a different future. These all came amidst perhaps a common reckoning the one conclusion many, many of us might agree with, that, that, we have, that we feel, we commonly feel like our democracy, our leaders, our systems have failed us, that powerful people have outside influence, that opportunity seems to be available to a declining few. I think of Robert F. Kennedy's speech in Indianapolis on the day Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. He, a white man connected to political royalty, spoke honestly and calmly in front of a crowd that was largely black. He spoke to what faced our nation, a choice to lean into violence or to continue to work toward the free society that we could become. This is what leaders do, present the moments, the choices, forecast their principles and stand by them. 
and they work towards a vision. I wanted to highlight this moment because it is that demeanor in times of upheaval, tragedy, that we want to embody, that we are primed for by what we foster in this community and our societies. This, thus, it is most important that we realize, hold on to, and expand who we are. Thank you. All right, and thank you, thank you, Joan, David, and Christian. So now we have an opportunity for some question and answering time. Um, please note that the chat had been turned off during the uh, presentations, but will be turned back on again. And that there are two places where you can send text during this period of time, right? Uh, the first is the chat. And if you'd like to comment on the addresses, you know, things like says nice job or thank you or things along those lines, that goes in the chat. If you have a question, click on the icon on the Zoom toolbar for the Q&A and post your question there. And I see there are questions coming in already and I'll be going over the Q&A uh, and uh, asking the question. All right, so question number one comes from Phyllis Rodriguez. Blind faith in science isn't always a good thing. Scientists and researchers are influenced by their historical period. Example is Darwin's theory of evolution supporting racist views of this time. How can we be sure that we can discern the best interpretations of science? And that comes from the Ethical Culture Society of Westchester. Anyone want to take that one on? Sure. You want me to address it? Go for it. Sure. I mean, blind faith is never desirable, never, never helpful. Um, but the very nature of science, if it is pursued as an open inquiry, it's really a kind of a, a democratic engagement among inquiring individuals. So the best criticism and critiques should come within the scientific inquiry. I mean, we need to have appropriate openness to critical analysis. We need to be appropriately hu uh, humble with respect to the claims we make. Uh, and engage in a dialogue, and there is no nothing comes with guarantees. That's magical thinking. Any any time you think you can get absolute guarantees for anything in life, you're engaging in a form of magical thinking, and that pervades much of religions throughout history. Right? But I think one of the things we're we're committed to here is to avoid that kind of magical thinking and to appreciate that open, self-critical engagement is the best guide we have. Nothing is a guarantee. Other panel uh, speakers want to take that on? Oh, go ahead and unmute. <laughs> I, I would just add to what David said that the reason that we know that the old race science is wrong is not a critique based on faith, but a critique based on new science and retesting and realizing that it is simply not true. It's the same thing with those who um, were fond of the bell curve um, um, theory that you know, looking at the data more seriously and analyzing it proved that that theory was simply wrong. Go ahead, Christian. I, I was... In terms of sort of like thinking about who is in the like how voices are included, you know, in the process of science and the process of, of, of thinking and, and that be a thing that we pay attention to is that I think that was what makes science works better, but that's also what makes democracy works better work better. Right. And so and so I think the turn the science isn't the problem, but coming to also the, the realization where are the places where there are guards or sort of barriers to entry for various voices to shape those ideas, to check on like, you know, make sure that this is like this, I mean, objective process, right? It's in, in, in 
So I, I think, you know, that speaking to that process is an important part of how we check those things. Thank you. Uh, and I see Joan made a nod to an economic response to overcome the irrationality we confront. Um, can David and Christian provide their responses to that? What was the, what was the, I didn't quite get the. the uh, Joan made a nod to an economic response to overcome the irrationality we confront. I think I, I would rather have a, a, clar a clarification of the question. Spell that out, the, the, the intent. Okay, uh, maybe. I, uh, I, I think I know here where he was going, David, so I'll try <laughs> that. Go right ahead. Um, I think where he was going was when I talked about how um, the, anti-democracy tends to thrive where there's economic and social inequality. And so uh, attacking the economic inequality will also be self-reinforcing with democracy. Yeah, I think that's absolutely correct. I think that, uh, that when people feel left out, uh, uh, powerless, impotent, incapable of understanding what's happening and feeling betrayed, in different ways and, and in which their, their expectations and hopes and aspirations have been uh, undermined. Uh, they are raw material for all kinds of fan fantastic and um, uh, imaginative scenarios, uh, different forms of uh, conspiracy theories and the systematic attack at systems they feel that have be betrayed them. I mean, that, uh, that book by, that I mentioned between Anne Case and Angus Deaton about death to despair details the way the, that much of the, the neoliberal policies of the last 40 and 50 years of both parties, I call the Democrats like Clinton and Obama as kind of um, a neoliberalism of the human face, but it was neoliberalism and it basically led to the disintegration of much of main, middle, middle America, of, of working class America and has led trails of devastation across this country, it provides fertile ground in which these kind of crazy ideas, which are always out there, take root and begin to grow. There's a fascinating article I just read today about a person who spent the last three weeks participating in and listening on QAnon chat groups. Right? And he talks in great detail about how, I mean, how these people, uh, he was surprised with the kind of community that they had found and the sense in which they felt betrayed. And the sense that this was a meaningful, they, they found a, 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 a theory which made sense of the way they felt betrayed. And then they felt a community which supported and respected them. Right? The most crazy set of theories and ideas that you can really imagine. Right? So I think, yes, if you can address the, the, the institutional disintegration that has taken place, uh, you undercut much of the, the ground which nurtures this kind of craziness. The craziness will be out there. It's been there throughout our whole history. Richard Hofstadter has a brilliant book that he wrote in the 1960s called The Paranoid Style of American Politics. Absolutely brilliant analysis. But when does that paranoid style take over and become profoundly threatening? It's when the established institutions and the established vehicles uh, undercut and do not provide the hopes and expect, uh, meet the hopes and expectations of human beings. And that has been a real problem. So I should say, put a slight last note on this. I have been very encouraged in the last couple of days that although Biden talks the language of Obama, he's engaging in a policy which very is very anti-Obama-ish, a major systematic engagement in, in potentially significant social change. I mean, whether he'll be able to carry that through, that's an issue well beyond our immediate discussion here. But I agree with the point that's being made. Thanks. And Christian, your perspective? Uh, I actually, I, I just, I probably just really shortly to build off so we have time for other questions. I, I think we're a nation, or we have been a nation where our economic system, uh, um, I think is basically fear driven. Um, where, and sort of speaking to the paranoia, it's like where people um, have to meet the anxiety very often of whether they're gonna be able to take care of their family, whether they're gonna be able to preserve their spot in line, all those things. And I think there are policies and ways that we can address that so that anxiety and so the fear sort of um, the attraction of fear isn't as palpable. I think if you have a system where folks don't have to worry about where to get health care, whether they're going to be able to pay their, for their health care, whether there's 
economic, uh, ec educational um, opportunities across um, areas and in in and for across groups, right? Then then maybe they they can take their attention away from things that are base needs to higher things, right? So in thinking about what kind of future do we want to be, can we address the, the problems, bigger problems, things like that. So that that's how I feel. Thank you. So there's a lot of questions about kind of the, the bubbles uh, that are uh, characteristic of our society these days. So here's one from Beth Baker from the Washington Ethical Society. Many of us in ethical societies live in blue bubbles politically. How can we connect with those magical thinkers in our society? Go ahead, Joan. Sure, I'll, I'll take a stab at that because I've been uh, reading recently um, some of the thoughts of people who have come out of the QAnon, what I would call cult, and what they say was helpful. And the thing they say was helpful was people being friends and just refusing to talk about that issue um, and about any of the issues connected with it, but still willing to walk with someone through the woods on a nature walk or have dinner. And I know that's really hard, uh, but being able to just say, we're not going to talk about that when it comes up and being friends gives people that sense of belonging in a different way, I think, and then gives them a way to have a lifeline back to uh, more of a reality-based thinking. David? I, I agree totally with what Joan is saying. I think it's very important when we think about these issues though, that we do not assume that the way to relate to individuals on a one-to-one -one basis is the same way in which we can relate to significant movements. Right, there's, there's really a profound difference between how you can relate to individuals. I think Joan is absolutely correct, uh, but we can't transpose that and assume that that is going to solve profound institutional problems. At that point, we really have to address, and it's not really through dialogue particularly, it's through systemic social change. And that's that has to be done through activist intervention, which goes back to the question of economic and community re revitalization. You need to do things which change the, condition, the conditions of daily life for people. Uh, and that's the, 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 the bridge. And that's not so much a rational dialogue. That is a progressive programmatic action. Uh, that's different from, but interpersonally, I think Joan is absolutely correct. Christian? Uh oh, Christian, you seem to be frozen. All right, I think uh, I'm going to move on to the next. Oh, wait, you're moving again. <laughs> okay, I've been, I was stiff then because y'all froze and then. I, <laughs> um, I, I think it's really important to preserve energy um, and, and pick the places where uh, it, it would be sustainable for you to do the things that you think are important towards like building the future that you want. Um, and I, I, I think conflict is important, um, but I think there are also times when, when you're, that's not also the place and the space that's built for um, the, the sort of relationship building that conflict, experiencing conflict in a, in a sort of um, um, manageable way can, Oh, Christian, I'm afraid you've frozen yet again. Um, I'm going to move us on to the next uh, question, if you don't mind. Um, so, uh, that's actually more of a comment. Uh, so, the question is, uh, to what extent do conspiracy theory beliefs come from an individual thinking magically or uncritically as compared to an individual being a victim of organized deception that tricks people into thinking they've been thinking independently and critically. That's from Ingo Volchek from Baltimore. Any takers? Conspiracy theories are dramatically interesting and they give, they, they, they make a story. 
right? They make a story which gives, which explains why people are suffering, right? The world is very complicated. It's very difficult, right? To, to understand what is going on for all of us. And we're all dependent upon our sources of expertise and the, and the groups that we trust, right? When you lose confidence in the groups that, that trust, as it were, right? <laughs> You're prey then to, you know, other groups, obviously, other, other stories, right? I mean, there's no simple answer. I mean, psychologically, we all need to have meaning. We all need meaningful stories to make sense of our lives. Right? We need to, to have a sense of what, what that our lives are meaningful and significant, and that we're part of something which is meaningful and significant, and that we have and we have something to look forward to. And when those things get undermined, whether you know, by whatever reason, whether it's personal tragedy, uh, family tragedy, or the destruction of communities, right? I mean. Take the experience we, we began with uh, um, recognizing the, the Native Americans. Well, the dis disintegration of their societies uh, led to widespread moral deterioration among the people. Alcoholism, other forms of self-destructive behavior. Right? Be, you know, it, it's not just a psychological problem, it's how does somebody whose society is, is destroyed, whose, whose meaningful daily life is undermined, how do they make sense of their lives? And if they can't, what do they do? I mean, and that's the opioid crisis. That's the, these deaths of despair that the case in Deaton explore. But it's any, any of us. All of us need social supports. The ethical movement is a set of social supports. And I think it's a reasonable, rational, and humanistic collective endeavor. Right? But people who don't have that, right, are, I mean, they, they need some place to belong. Now, that was the thing that was most remarkable one of the most remarkable things in this discussion I was reading today, I think it was the New York Times, where this fellow talked about his immersion in the QAnon conspiracy for the last three, three weeks, listening to the dialogue and the people really had created a community. He got to sort of appreciate their suffering and, 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 and the extent to which that community was morally sustaining for them at the price of craziness and destructive behavior and without really a, a productive future, but they, they couldn't see that and, they, and that's where they ended up. Complicated question. Not, I don't think if we can answer, we can address these problems at a, at a purely psychological level, right? nor at a simply rational level. We yeah. need institutional structural change. Thanks. Joan? Yeah. And, and I'll say that I think it, it is a combination of the two. You know, we are designed as human beings and I don't say uh, intellect, I don't mean, um, by creation, but through evolution to make up stories. And I distinguish between cohesive and coherent stories. And when, especially when we are in fear, we tend to leap to cohesive stories that hang together, but don't necessarily match reality and other people's experience. And so fear mongering is a way to put people in the mood to believe the cohesive story and not check it out. And I think that there is strong evidence that a lot of that um, fear mongering and creation of myths has happened. It, it's also connected with the authoritarian personality as some have talked about of wanting to believe in a person who has power also being in possession of more truth. And so when you have somebody who tries to be an authoritarian they are also trying to manipulate the lies. Um, again, you know, we address that fear through social change even more than we address it through direct trying to ration reason with people. I think back to my, um, what it seems now a lifetime ago when Harold Washington was elected mayor of Chicago in an extraordinarily racist uh, and um, contentious election. And he chose after the election to serve all the people and to give services to every neighborhood. And when he ran for re-election, he was elected with a much larger vote because that convinced people. The social change he brought actually changed minds more than arguing with people or um, any other means that one might do. Thank you. And Christian, do you want to give that a shot? I just feel bad I missed, I had to fix my computer, so I missed the original question. 
All right. And and this one, uh, <laughs> I've been reading a bunch of other questions. Which, um, which question did I just ask you guys? <laughs> um, whether, whether it's individual um, individual thinking that comes yeah. up with conspiracies yeah. or whether it's deliberate manipulation, Thank basically. You. I think it's a, I, I mean, I would say it's probably both end, but I, I think there's definitely folks who cynically stoked what's happening and continue to do that um, because it's, it's convenient. Um, but I'm also a big fan of what Joan said, um, which is, you know, the difference between cohesion and, and cohesive stories and coherent. And I think coherent requires relationship. Like I find out about who I am, my world, my fullness, because through my relationships and through kind of like difference intentionally. And so, and, and, and that helps build a more coherent, coherent idea of who I am and in and, 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 and my being, right? But then I, I think, I mean, I was reading on the New York Times about a, a woman who, who escaped from uh, the conspiracy thinking. And it's like, there, there are people who are thinking that they're doing rationally, they're doing research, which I mean, to them, well, the, the sort of so-calling research is reading streams of things over, you know, that are, are, are sort of ruminating around these same topics from similar sources. Um, but, and, and it starts to fit in a way for them. So it's, you know, I, I think it's, it's encouraging. I mean, someone I saw, I don't know if we got to this question, but like, how do we get out of our own sort of bubbles and circles? And I think that's, that's part of, you know, self-encouraging, group encouraging for that, but I think that's modeling for also other other folks in society. It's like, well, what is our responsibility for, for our understanding of, of how do we get to truth? Um, and so. Right. Thank you for that. So there are a number of questions also having to do with the role of emotion in uh, making uh, rational decisions, I guess, or uh, certainly beneficial decisions. Uh, part of it has to do with, you know, it's quite possible to follow rational thinking to disastrous ends. Uh, there's also been a number of uh, who have been uh, well thought of philosophers who uh, also had a lot of uh, attitudes that were uh, objectionable uh, in, in many cases, um, racist in particular. So uh, what are the thoughts about kind of that interaction of emotion and rational thought um, and how one helps or doesn't the other? Well, you can't separate the two of them. I mean, they really, they, I mean, you, you, you can't, without emotion, rational thought doesn't even come to decisions. People can't act, all right? So that, that's, that notion that those are somehow antagonistic are simply a historical mistake, all right? Rational thought and emotional thought, you know, I mean, are inter, 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 integrated in the human personality. The question is not between rational and emotional. The question really has to do with the nature of the kind of rational emotional thinking you might want to say that people are engaged in but that relates to their lifestyle to the community the problem is that people are ensconced in communities we all are and the communities all constitute the frame of meaning and the reinforcement for our belief systems all right that's I mean, christian was referring to that but of course it's a belief system all right you talked about a bubble well a bubble is a kind of systematic belief system that people are encased in all right so it is self it tends to be self reinforcing right facts which are which support the belief system are accepted right or more in fact all are are searched out and found and reinforced facts which counter counter that are discarded not paid attention to right so the belief systems become self reinforcing and they do function in our society not so much you know individually psychologically they function in our society in terms of media structures the, the whole media operation. We got rid of, for example, equal time provisions in 1986 under the Reagan administration, right? where people had to confront in some ways through the ma mass media, right? opposite, uh, opponent, opposite points of view. So you go on to the one American network and you don't get opposite points of view. You get systematically, systematically self-reinforcing, you might say intellectual bubbles 
But I, you know, you, we all, I think, perhaps tend toward wanting to hear facts which reinforce our sense of who we are and what our community believes. And that can be a problem on both, on many sides. How much, how open is the community in which we're a part? How open is it to other information? And how open is it to being self-critical of its own belief systems? That's what I tried to speak a little bit to in the remarks I made, right? That's a complicated question and we can't be too uh, self-satisfied that we are not ourselves to some extent self-reinforcing a certain kind of uh, self-closure, let us say. But, you know, so what constitutes the, the, the source of criticism which criticizes a, a set of belief systems, right? It's not clear in the social, social world right, that one cannot fabricate interpretations of any event. I mean, watching QAnon people now explain why Trump didn't institute mil a military or a takeover and put the leading Democrats to death, right, as, you know, they anticipated. Well, now you got a whole new theory coming, developing, how to, how to deal with that. But it doesn't, that doesn't undermine the lack of, of effective results doesn't undermine the cohesiveness of the system. It's a complicated, difficult problem. John? Yeah, um, I always use as an illustration of the limits of logic, my own name. My mother did not like the name Joanne. So she spelled my name Joan, J-O-N-E, so no one could ever make a mistake with it. <laughs> and I grew up having to fight for my name, including most recently being on the phone with customer service, trying to figure out why Alexa will not pronounce my name right. <laughs> uh, and the answer was you have to spell your name wrong in the app in order to get it right. <laughs> um, so, you know, this interplay of reason and logic with emotion has always been for me an interesting issue. And I do think that metaphor of the elephant is, is a really good one. And it shows that this is not a new challenge. The, the fable of the wise sages who grab hold of the tail and the uh, ear and think they have different things when they all have the same was the original uh, meaning. But I also think there is that challenge of people who go into the forest and find leaves and vines and think they found an elephant. And the only answer really to all of that is to keep checking with other people who are more able to see than uh, things that you can't see. Oh, and, and that's really, you know, community is the only answer. And it also means sometimes deliberately getting out of our bubbles and, and seeing what else is a possibility out there. Thank you. And Christian? I, I love the John brought in the elephant stories that was in the draft of <laughs> in the trying to work that in. But um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm trying to sort of figure out a way to second a lot of what Joan was saying about intentionally finding people like, you know, views ways of, of knowing that are different from yours and that might challenge your 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 way um you know because I, I feel like that's something we all should be doing constantly i think I, I i intentionally try to watch documentaries on uh on specifically the uh, the being an outsider and and being and, and being a woman uh, and be, like and becoming and even even fiction still, like even thinking about cuties um, uh, that had this amazing backlash because of, uh, of the suggestiveness of the dance while missing also like the bigger sort of like in, in what the artist or the director and writer was trying to really communicate, which is the rage that it's sort of becoming a, a young woman, right, induces, right? It's like people talked about the dance and didn't talk about the violence, right? Or didn't talk about the, the sort of pressures of balancing out the tr uh, traditional uh, uh, sort of foreign identity, quote unquote foreign identity with the sort of you know, modern, um, you know, metropole identity. So 
And, and those things give me insights. Like, what am I not thinking about? What am I not seeing? Who don't I see? Um, so the, the, I, so I, I really, it's, that's been something I've been trying to foster and trying to find ways to share is like, th this is, this is what this looks like for me. Right. Even, even as a black person, I'm still concerned with who is an outsider as, as in, in, um, as a man, I'm concerned with what is it that I can't see? Thank you. Okay, so here's a question about advertising. Advertising portrays existence as affluent, uh, not as life is in order to sell products. People believe affordability when it can be unaffordable, encourages and promotes magical thinking. So what do you see as the role of uh, the kind of uh, consumer industry in kind of driving some of the uh, uh, concerns that have been raised today? Joan, you want to start? Sure. I don't know if I'm the only one on the panel who actually took courses in marketing in college. <laughs> um, where I learned that the difference between marketing and advertising is that with marketing, you try to create demand through stories and through connecting with other desires of people. So for instance, surveys showing that uh, um, a flavor from childhood that people missed was graham crackers, created a graham cracker cereal. And then the marketers could play on that to try to create demand. and. Um, I think it's absolutely connected that we live in a society where um, both advertising and marketing try to help us to having needs that we don't have, to turning wants into needs. And that's a kind of a story. Um, again, using skepticism is really helpful. Um, if you're a parent, helping your kids learn to deconstruct what's going on in that advertisement really helps. Thanks, Christian. Um, I I like to joke that in another life I was a madman, uh, one of the madmen, because I love coming up with slogans and uh, acronyms to 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 explain things and say ideas. But um, I think that we have to take a really good look at what role does social media um, play in terms of what, what is their interest, right? And what is this sort of the expanding lines? Like there's no lines in terms of what they do, but there's, there's been a transformation. They provide news, they connect people, they help form identity. They're like, uh, they, they spread ideas and what I think folks like us, maybe who, and I think our community, we start, we're, we're one of a larger, you know, groups of institutions that are struggling with how to, uh, to be relevant in that environment. Um, and there are people who've been training over years to be ready for this moment. Like white supremacists have seen the potential of the internet and this moment has has you know been a, you know their moment a moment to shine right and and so I think one of the things is I work in violence prevention as a community educator and they um, one of the big ideas that we sort of um, I was in a, a workshop and they they said as a as an educator when we talk about you know, sort of anti-violence or relationship. We're one of like amongst thousands of other messages that are saying something completely different. We are like one little voice in a, a, a waterfall, right? Of other messaging that they're gonna get. So we, I mean, I, mean, I, I think that, 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 that means that we have to look at grassroots ways of getting, being louder and being more visible. Because um, I don't think we can wait for legislators to figure out, well, how do you stop this? We can't rely on 
um, social media companies to uh, regulate their content in a way that you know is going to address the problem. It's, it's it's figuring out how to, how to be you know better in the in these spaces um, and be louder. Uh, and it's not really always about numbers because there's there's some very loud people who get a lot of attention and that you know spirals out. Okay, I'm going to step in at this moment because uh, we did agree as planners that we wanted to make sure we had uh, time for all three of you to give a kind of a closing minute, if you will. So, uh, Joan, if you'd be so kind. Yeah, I'm not sure I have a full minute to say it, but mm -hmm. I think there's many paths here that we need to take, and I see some of the other questions address this. I think that, you know, there is the personal path of convincing one person at a time. We have 55% of white Americans, of white adults, believe that racism against Black people doesn't exist. You know, if that could change to 45%, we could do different things in this country. So there is some advantage to that 10% shift. There's also a huge advantage into spending time on political change of a systemic nature. Um, and these things all work together. I saw in the um, question and answer, somebody said, which of these do we do? And I think the answer is figure out where your energy is and we need to make sure all of them are happening. Thanks. David. Yeah, uh, I can second what Joan said, but let me, let me go back to the previous question because I think it's a good way to summarize this. I think that we're talking about a question of marketing, but that presupposes the centrality of the market. I think one needs to reframe it. That's the, I think the wrong way to frame it. And I think that, I think within the context of what is appropriately marketable, we should just, you know, normal reasonable constraints and, and not worry about it. The thing is to take things, there are things that should not be part of the market. How does one move from an extractive economy, right? To taking things out of the market and giving, for, for example, as a fundamental contradiction between a market and, de and democratic self-government where the collectivity has some control and some responsibility, right? So there you look at the areas that, how does one create community revitalization using things like land trusts, for example, which takes land out of the market and turns it into a collective property, right? Which then is de democratically determined, right? So I think, I think that the question here becomes a structural reframing in many ways, right? And we have to appreciate that the market is is has a role to play. I don't want I don't want people to, to control local grocery stores or local restaurants, right? But you can't deal with problems of the environment. You can't deal with with the major structural problems of the society. You can't really ensure major allocations of resources, right? Unless you have the capacity for democratic self-government. So some question is, you know, in the housing issue, for example, you're not going to solve the problem of housing unless you get significant elements of housing out of the market. I'm, I'm gonna give you a plan for it now, but I think the question has to do with a certain kind of reframing. And otherwise we just fall into a trap where we're just talking about, you know, how we can compete among much more powerful forces in order to, in, in a market society. And that is not going to be very helpful. Thank you, David. And Christian, um, final minute. <laughs> final minute. <laughs> I think that I really wanted to capture um, with my few minutes uh, before the fact that we do have a place as ethnoculturists in, in terms of shaping where the, this country goes and we have been a part of it and we will continue to be a part of it. Um, and, and, and I think, but I say that not emptily because I think there's some things this is an extraordinarily important moment for us to expand and think about reaching more people and more places and innovating the, a lot of the way that we do things. How we work and present our communities, how voices are included in this direction, right? As because we could exp end up out of this moment in a very different position that we, we, we came into it. I think about last Thursday uh, or last week, Rochester, uh, some folks in Rochester met to talk about meeting a new, uh, developing an ethical society. It was, there were like 60 people on the call. 
Um, and so this is a time when I, and usually I don't want to say more, especially in the pandemic that more and more and more, but we actually should be thinking about more, like how can we be more of ourselves and give more of what we're trying to do and become more of what we talk about and, 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 and um, believe. So that's my, that's my little bit more than a minute. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you all three of you for your presentations today and for the participation in the uh, chat. We're going to move along now uh, to uh, some another aspect. And this has to do with uh, the American Ethical Union and your way to one way that you can support us. The, the union began in 1889, 13 years after the founding of the first ethical society. And by then, there were four ethical societies in the United States, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, and St. Louis. And their coming together demonstrated the commitment to expanding the breadth and depth of the ethical culture movement. And now we have 24 societies, and hopefully growing, and we have the opportunity now to really bring uh, ourselves together in a way that was just not possible before. And so the All Society uh, platform program is one of those ways. We've had representatives from a whole bunch of societies working on this, a lot of different societies uh, involved in the planning just of this one particular event. And we want to have more. And one way we can ensure that we have more is to find more ways to uh, kind of monetize uh, our activity here. So we are inviting you all uh, to make donations uh, to the All Society Program Fund. And you can do this by going to the AEU website and their donation page. The uh, thing is, when you make a donation there, you want to make sure you select All Society Platform Program from the drop-down list on where you would like this donation to go. Um, and uh, you know, we'll also be asking for individual donations via email and on the website, and we'll be asking uh, societies to contribute as well. This is the kind of event that everyone benefits from. And if we have it well supported from our own community, we can do a whole lot more with it. Um, so with that in mind, uh, please uh, think generously and, and take a look at the chat for the link if, you, uh, if that is helpful for you. And I'd like to turn it over to Vandra. Oops, misspoke. Turn it over to Dupree. Yes, it is. Thank you, everyone. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us Above us only sky Imagine all the people Living for today And there's no countries It isn't hard to do Nothing to kill or die for And no religion to Imagine all the people living life in peace. You might say I'm a dreamer, but I'm 
man, not you, oh, only one. I hope someday you'll join us, and the world will be as one. Imagine no possession I wonder if you can No need for greed or hunger A brotherhood of man Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You might say that I'm just a dreamer, but I'm lost to you. the world will be as one will be as one Thank you. You may say I'm a dreamer. Thank you to Frey and Barry. And the world is my country. All humans are my brethren. And to do good is my religion. Thanks be to John Lennon and Tom Payne. What a great platform. Thank you all so, so very, very much for participating, the panelists, everybody for being here. And Christian for reminding us that now is the time to really spread the good news of ethical culture. So we will do this again. Please mark your calendars for the next All Societies platform on March the 28th, when Congressman Jamie Raskin will be our speaker. Now, local societies may be having their own coffee hours, so please post your links in the chat if you're a local society and you plan to have a, a coffee hour. And now my very special thanks, our special thanks to everybody that participated today. The panelists, Joan Jonas Lewis, Day, Dr. David Sprinson, Christian Hayden, and Bart Warden. To the lead organizers, Chris Kamen from Ethical Humanist Society of the Triangle in North Carolina. To Elaine Durbach from the Ethical Culture Society of Essex County in New Jersey, Ning Cox from the Washington Ethical Society, the technical crew, Anna Orchid Jans from the American Ethical Union, Bart Warden from the American Ethical Union, John Pfeiffer from Washington Society, and Tati Sena from the Brooklyn Society for Ethical Culture, along with me from the Brooklyn Society for Ethical Culture, and Robin Kravitz from the Washington Ethical Society. Thank you all very much for being here today. And now we will go to our final moment as we extinguish 
uh, the candles and say together, may human kindness comfort you and bring you peace. Thank you. Feel free to join your local societies through the links on the chat. Thank you. Don't know, no fear.